Now, there was some discussion about my speech the night before, some more discussion about my prepared text later during the day while we were walking. As a matter of fact, there was an archbishop by the name of Obishop Obal who was supposed to give the invocation. And he threatened not to give the invocation if we didn't change the speech. While I was working on my speech, I was reading a copy of the New York Times. And I saw a group of black women in Southern Africa carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. So I said in my prepared text, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours too, it must be ours. There was not anything in the president proposed civil rights legislation to deal with the whole question of voting. Some people thought if you had a sixth grade education, you should be considered literate and you should be able to register to vote. Those of us in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee took the position that the only qualification for being able to register to vote in the 11 states of the old Confederacy from Virginia to Texas should be that of age and residence. Back in 1963, the state of Mississippi had a black voting age population of more than 450,000, and only about 16,000 blacks were registered to vote. There was one county in Alabama, Lowndes County, between Selma and Montgomery. The county was more than 80% African American, but there was not a single registered African American voter in the county. In Selma, only 2.1% of blacks of voting age were registered to vote. Yet to pass a so-called literacy test, on one occasion a man was asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap, or count the number of jelly beans in a jar. People stood in unmovable line. So we wanted to find a way through my speech to dramatize the issue. So in the speech, in the body of it, I said, you tell us to wait. You tell us to be patient. We cannot wait. We cannot be patient. We want our freedom and we want it now. By Rustin said to me, John, you can't say that. <laughs> he said, the Catholic Church believe in being patient. I think he was just being a little cynical or facetious. But then near the end of the speech, there was a line there that says something like, if we do not see meaningful progress here today, the day may come when we will not confine our marching on Washington, but we may be forced to march through the South the way Sherman did, nonviolently. They said, oh, no, you can't say that, John. <laughs> so even after the music had started and the program was underway, Roy Wilkin came to me and said, John, can you change it? I said, Mr. Wilkin, my friend, my brother, this speech represents the people that we are working with in the South, the young people that make up the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Then Dr. King came back again, said, John, that doesn't sound like you. <laughs> then Mr. Randolph, this prince of a man, this beloved man, he had been born in another country, another continent, probably would have been prime minister, president, was a wonderful human being. So John, we come this far together. Can't we stay together? I couldn't say no to A. Philip Randolph. I couldn't say no to Martin Luther King Jr., a man who was my hero, my inspiration. And we made the changes.